Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you, Sylvia. Thank you, Anna and Marsha, for inviting me back here. It's my fourth trip to Sazima in eight years, which I think is yeah, some sort of a record. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, it's very well known that after a five year, five day journey from Penzance, a 19 year old Humphrey Davy, seen here, full <laughs> Jacobin haircut. Uh, arrived in Clifton on the 7th of October 1798, taking up the role of superintendent of the new medical new Atlantic institution, thereafter the MPI. He would hold this position for the following two and a half years, which he received an annual salary of £200. The aim of the MPI, established following a protracted fundraising campaign led by Thomas Meadows, during the previous five years, was to investigate whether or not the factitious airs or gases that had been identified during the previous half century or so by savants, including Joseph Black, Joseph Priestley, and Henry Cavendish, possessed any therapeutic properties, especially in the cure and mitigation of consumption of tuberculosis. As every commentator on Davy has noted, while at the MPI, he made a major discovery in hematic chemistry through the observation of the physiological effects of nitrous oxide began his electrical researches and became close to Robert Sully and Samuel Coleridge, poets. Consequences of these friendships included David publishing a few poems in Sully's Anna Anthology and in, Co and in Coleridge, a range of David C. through <coughs> the Bristol Press of Biggs and Cottle, William Wurzel's preface to the second edition of Lyrical Ballads as well as its new second volume, that fundamental founding text of English Romanticism. David's close connection with these Romantics has always given, given him a special place in the history of science and history of literature, though one which has some authors have struggled to come to terms with. For example, June Fulmer, in her biography of David's early years, is seeking to minimize the closeness of David to Coleridge, is reduced to writing that at most during David's Clifton years, they were together at most 13 days, as if the quality and intensity of a relationship could be measured by temporal duration. Now, in this talk, I have only time to discuss Davy's work on nitrous oxide and the annual anthology volumes, that is, up until around the middle of 1800. I will take seriously, and on their own terms, almost on a month-by-month -month basis, the interests and mutual directions <coughs> of Davy, Sully, Coleridge, Meadows, and their circle when they were while they were in Bristol centering on the MPI. Thus, I hope to avoid the pitfall that tends to trap those scholars who telescope their Bristol period into a single time frame. As Kenneth Johnson has reminded us, throughout the 1790s, things changed so rapidly that it cannot be taken for granted that what pertained in October 1798, say, did so in December 1799. The MPI had been organised by the politically radical Oxford London Edinburgh trained physician Thomas Fellows. He received his MD from Oxford University in 1786, becoming reader in chemistry there the following year. At some point then, so by some point between then and his enforced departure in 1792, he muted the idea of using gases for, for therapeutic purposes. Forced to resign his readership because of his anti-government pro-French revolution pro-Jacobin and general democratic politics, which was not then a British value, I won't comment about today, Beddoes was subjected to Home Office surveillance and harassment, <coughs> appearing on a list of disaffected and seditious persons along with Priestley and others. He is thus one of Johnson's unusual suspects. This is the Home Office list. This is those people who kept under, under surveillance by <laughs> Secret Service. The problem with studying the MPI is that few of Beddoe's personal papers have survived, nor have any of the MPI's administrative papers, such as case notes, involved notebooks, accounts, that uh, doubtless created during short distance being located. Thus, with, with some exceptions, accounts of those who, for instance, experienced the effects of nitrous oxide exist only in Beddoe's notice of some observations made at the Medical and Medical Institution, published in November <coughs> 1799, or Davies research as chemical and philosophical published in July 1800. Other contemporary sources relating to the MPI include Davies' letters to his mother and to his maid of Cornish patron, David Skilling. 
More recently, to supplement these sources, Rice have used to varying extents and degrees of success documents from the Watt, Wedgwood, and some smaller archives. This paper builds on that approach with the aim of producing a provide a better understanding of what happened in and around the MPI during Davies' time there, which, as I have argued elsewhere, became the model of the laboratory practice Davies brought with him to the Royal Institution in London when he was appointed there in the spring of 1801. On his arrival in Clifton, Davies found that Bedos had just moved into a large house in Bondi Place. Sharing this house, uh, sharing this house were Bedos' wife Anna uh, and the two young sons uh, of his deceased patient, William Lampton. And they'd been entrusted to Bedos for their perpetual education before entering Eton College. And Davies had some responsibility in helping with this. It was not only the members of the Bellows household that David came into quickly to know. Bellows had lived in Clifton for more than five years by the time David arrived, and others formed a large circle of acquaintances in Bristol and the surrounding area with whom David rapidly became involved. Some, some of these uh, became very well known figures, they became very well known figures in their own right, such as the physician and later lecturer on uh, Peter Roger. Um, Publisher Joseph Cottle, the radical lawyer James Losh, and the tanner Thomas Paul. Later, David meets Robert Sully, as well as Sandra College, who had actually left Bristol in September, the month before David arrived. Sully and Cottle were natives of Bristol, while Losh saw much of Bellows during 1798, partially as a patient when he lived in, lived in Bath and later in Shirehampton. There, the poet William Wordsworth, also seen with Jacobin haircut. Um, stayed with him in June that year before going with Coleridge to the German-speaking lands. Others whom David knew are more obscure, though no less significant for his life and career at this point. And such figures uh, include the medics John King and Robert Kinglake, and members of Free Bristol, White Merchant families, William Coates, William Clayfield, and Charles Danvers, that David had easy access to wine <coughs> to use to a part of job. Meadows and trusted David with the task of spending the money that, he had, that he'd taken so long to raise, arranged for him to visit the NPI's major subscribers. David thus became involved with the business of acquiring Six Diary Square in which to house the NPI. In early January, David visited Birmingham to meet some of the Midlands industrialists who had agreed to contribute, including James Watt, the great engineer, his business partner, Matthew Bolton, uh, in the centre, and as well as James Kerr here, who particularly impressed David. David discussed chemical theory with both Watt Senior and Kerr, expressing pleasure that both still adhere to the phlogiston theory, and that Kerr especially did not believe in the existence of colour proposed by Antoine Lavoisier. In addition to providing financial support for the MPI, Watt had constructed a gas apparatus that would be at its core, <coughs> and this is described the second part of considerations on the medicinal use of factitious airs, a five-part publication that went through a number of editions appearing under both his and Bellows's <coughs> name. During his first few months in Clifton, David's position with the MPI did not require full attention and so had time for other activities. And indeed, with some of those, he partially subverted the original intentions of the, behind the MPI, though most related to Bellows' concerns in one way or another. For example, David expanded his medical learning by seeing the patients at the Bristol Infirmary and also the majority of Bredbedders as private patients. Indeed, David claims that this provided a better opportunity than had he studied medicine in Edinburgh or London. A job, another job that Bedders gave David was to oversee the printing in Bristol, the first volume of the West Country Collection. Entitled Contributions to Physical and Medical Knowledge, principally from the West of England, Bellows had publicly advertised this collection of essays at the end of August 1798. By the time David was seeing the first and only volume through the press, more than a third of it was taken up with two very long, highly speculative papers that he had written while still in Cornwall, and which had contributed to bringing David to Bellows' attention in the first place. David, in a youthful rush of publication, had a few copies, separate copies, printed off for distribution. Another activity that occupied Davy, and one that does not seem to involve Bellows, was the continuation of his mineralogical pursuits. He quickly asked his mother to send him, send 
in his collection from Penzance. In Bristol, Dave initially worked on minerals in conjunction with Clayfield, who recently, for the first time in England, found Ost, and this is here, um, on the banks of the River Severn, uh, a large seam of sulfate of strontium, a mineral that had only been discovered in Scotland during 1790 uh, by the chemistry lecturer at Glasgow University, Thomas Hope. He and David visited the vein at the end of October, and David later helped him with various chemical experiments on the mineral. Although continuous experiments, he didn't like prevented him undertaking complete analysis. By now, six dowry squares, seen here in the interwar uh, photograph, have been acquired, and David became busy erecting a fine laboratory in pneumatic hospital, and I hope we shall begin our experiments in a month. In mid-February, Bellows told Watt that it would soon be ready for patients, and, the nature, and in the nature of such projects, delays occurred, and towards the end of February, David told Giddy that the laboratory would be ready in early March. It was around this time that Sully first seems to have met David. Although he had been in and around Bristol during the previous few months, Sully had always had been away travelling for significant periods. Though more until this point, he seems hardly to have known Bellows. He attended some of Bellows' lectures in the spring of 1798 and thought him a poor versifier. By February 1799, Sully was seeing Bellows frequently for his health, which was never of the best. best. It was that month that Sully, in his letters, first referred to Davy, who clearly made a strong impression. Davy, he wrote, was a very extraordinary young man, lately, lately settled here, adding that he is going to show me his poems, of which I hear much from tolerable judges. That Davy had not yet shown Sully his poems does suggest that, that they had only met quite recently. Sully now, became, Sully now began taking a strong interest in the MPI, for example, telling friends in mid-March that it would open the next day. I was concerned that the first trial should prove unacceptable. He was concerned that if the first trial should prove unsuccessful, an outcry would be raised against it. They would also find a difficulty in getting patients, even in hopeless disorders. People are not fond of having experiments tried on them. <laughs> not surprising. The MPI did eventually open advertising in the Bristol Gazette on the 21st of March, which noted that it would be attended, presumably daily, uh, by Bellows and Davy between 11 and 1. By the middle of April, the MPI had 80 outpatients, which laid to rest the fears expressed by Southern and others. But it was not necessarily gastro that these patients received. At the beginning of March, Bellows was using genitalis, derived from fox gloves, as a treatment for consumption. Towards the end of April, Bellows told Josiah Wedgwood that our pneumatic institution goes on prosperously. We have completely established the power of digitalis in consumption. Bellows seems to have, seems to have perceived no incongruity in the juxtaposition of the MPI and digitalis, which suggests, as, as I've discussed elsewhere, that after five years of fundraising for the MPI, Bellows had lost focus on investigating gas-based therapies. Sully, however, did see the discrepancy, writing mid-April, April, Bellows and his younger sister are doing wonders at the pneumatic institution but not by gases. What they wanted for consumption seems to be found in the Fox Love tincture. By this time, David showed Sully some of his poems, written or at least drafted, when aged 16 and 17. Sully was so impressed with his early production of genius that he invited David to contribute some of them to what he then termed his almanac, which would be published later in that year as the first volume of annual anthology. Most of these poems occurred on David's notebooks, seen here, was not only prepared for publication, but also seems to have contemplated producing his own volume of verse. David is one of the messiest people I have ever had the misfortune to study. <laughs> <laughs> Turning out of that oxide, in mid-April, David told Sully about one of the initial stages of his uncovering the remarkable physiological properties of the phlogisticated nitrous air, as Priestley, its discoverer, had named it, or nitrous phosoxide, as Davy initially termed it, or following the Wazier in the literature, gaseous oxide and az azote, or nitrous oxide. The consequences of this discovery, which strongly engaged Sully's interest, would dominate Davy's work in the ensuing months, culminating in the publication of his researches. At the start of March, Davy recollected producing large quantities of the impure gas, with which he began self-experimenting and administering to others. That much Sully and Coates 
Right? But there's found that inhaling gas produces a tendency to faint, giddiness, and slower pulse. During the first part of April, Damien made pure nitrous oxide, and this produced the first surviving piece of contemporary evidence related to Damien's investigation. In his letter of November, April 1799 to a journal of natural philosophy, he briefly reported experiments presumably performed in the preceding days of the effect of the gas on animals and of breathing both the gas himself, both pure twice and mixed with oxygen, and once mixed with oxygen. The form produced no disagreeable effects. While the mixture produced effects that were very peculiar, should they be confirmed by future experiments in point of proof of valuable medicine? The same day, Davy resurrected in his researches, inhaled the pure gas, making no reference to experiencing any physiological effects, only that the gas was safe to breathe. The minimal effects of inhaling the gas were also the impression provided by Sully a few days later. Davy's early accounts describing the effects of nitrous oxide are not especially detailed. They give no information as to, as to what he thought the sense of purity the gas might be, nor did he know the volume, volume of the gas in the inhaled or for how long. This would change in the experiments he conducted during the second half of April. Again, according to the researchers on the 16th, with King Lake present, Davy inhaled three quarts or just over, um, <clears throat> for just over 30 seconds. That's about three litres. Uh, a quart is roughly equal to, to a litre. Um, this produced a slight, in him a slight giddiness, a feeling similar to the first stage of intoxication, but unattended by pleasurable sensation, and King Lake noted a cricket pulse. The following day, Meadows was present when David held four quarts, and the day after, 18th April, in Meadows' presence again, he undertook many experiments, including breathing 16 quarts, that's just over 18 litres, 18 litres of nitrous oxide, in seven minutes which had the effect of making him dance around about the bulge as a mad man. <laughs> That's what we expect. During May, Roger arrived in Bristol, where he inhaled mass oxide, and in July, wrote David a description of his experiences, which included vertigo and tingling in his hands, and he did not experience the least pleasure from any of these sensations. Hmm. Roger may have been one of the philosophers to whom Francis Edgeworth, that's better as his um, stepmother, also visiting Clifton that May, referred to as finding, when they inhaled, nothing but a sick stomach and a giddy head. Although she referred to the gas as having sensations of the nectar of the gods, she fully recognised that not everybody reacted in the same way, writing that faith, great faith, is, I believe, necessary to produce any effect. And that issue has been explored, well explored by Ian Galinsky. Nevertheless, Beddoe started giving serious consideration to the possible therapeutic value of nitrous oxide. At the end of June, he wrote to Watt saying he and David concluded that it would be of use in palsy and a hopeless, hopeless case of debility, and they cautiously began clinical trials. This involved administering the gas to a hemiplegic patient who, had, who has a consequence through away his crutch and walks without support. Now, that kind of evidence is just so hard to interpret, but what actually I'm going to pass over it uh, in silence. All in all, Beddoes believed these results meant the present will be the most splendid era in medicine. Beddoes was nothing if not an excellent self publicist As there's little evidence which suggests that clinical trials continued during July or August, though the administration of gas to two individuals did, with the consequent reporting of its mind-altering effects. Davies notebook recording his experiments in mid-July, which is the only one to have survived in this time, includes a count of Sully and his wife, Edith. Uh, in, in inhaling on the 13th of July. David also continued experimenting on himself and on 27th of August, after inhaling seven quarts of nitrous oxide, he wrote in his notebook in inch high letters. Davy and Newton. Oh. Oh. And note that, that Davy goes first in this uh, comparison. <laughs> <laughs> And then, <laughs> sorry? Very modest. Very, oh, very modest. Oh, yes, I'm completely modest. Um, an indication, possibly unconscious, of Davy's vaunting ambition. <laughs> now, one general lesson which I would draw from studying the interactions over time of Davy, Coleridge, Southerly, Wordsworth, Bellows, etc., is emphasised that the cultural categories that we now work with are not those which pertain around the beginning of the 19th century. And to impose them, as has happened in the past, 
Sidhu and Fuma, and in popular culture to this day, is to miss much in the understanding of what these figures thought they were doing. By examining in detail as much of as possible, we can build a picture of the cultural interactions which would otherwise be missed. This might have the added advantage that it will challenge our own usual cultural categories, which if it contributes to removing the trope of the two cultures rhetoric from our vocabulary can only be a good thing. Thank you. Thank you.